Hi, my name is Marie Uffroy. I'm a VFX technical artist at Unity working on visual effect graph and I'm going to present to you how I created the smoke portal sample that was made with Unity 22.3 to showcase the latest features. Visual effect graph sample is a HDRP project and is available for download on GitHub using the link in the package manager or in the video description. The sample was created to showcase specifically the new six-way lighting feature. The six-way feature is a new lighting method in visual effect graph for smoke-like particles that uses bake-like maps from six axes to calculate the light and shadow on a sprite, giving a more realistic and volumetric aspect. It is especially useful for very dense smoke effects like explosions, for example. Thanks to this feature, you can avoid the cost of rendering volumes for smoke-like effects and render sprites instead. For more details on the smoke lighting feature used in this sample, you can have a look at the blog post that explains the workflow and the presentation that was made at GDC 23. For more details, the links are in the description. In this sample, we also wanted to show you a new fog workflow, something out of the usual, showcasing different types of lights and uh, in a limited size environment. After having those ideas, we started fetching references of magical portals to see what kind of effects were done and make sure smoke would fit for what we had in mind. The smoke sample VFX is composed of different layers that we added together to form a complete effect. The main piece is a smoke simulation exported from Houdini, but we also have other effects completing it. A smoky kong tour, the portal simulation, works and sparkers, distortion, ground, rocks and sparkers, flames and smoke. And finally, the scene is completed with VFX instances for the crystals and HDRP local volumetric fog. We will detail those various elements and see how they contributed to create a coherent, complete environment. But let's start with our main piece, the portal. The portal at the center of the sample was simulated in Houdini. We wanted this vortex effect to be the centerpiece of the scene and the smoke needed to be dense enough to have a beautiful volumetric interaction between smoke and light using the six-way lighting feature. We started from a tall shape and I did a mountain node as it's an easy way to add noise on a primitive. Then the pyro source node allows us to make points from this shape that will be the points used for our simulation. It also sets up density and temperature attributes that would be useful for the solver later. But the points repartition was uniform at this step, so with an attribute noise on the position, we could make it random. We also wanted more noise on the density attribute, so we used the second attribute noise node to multiply density attribute randomly. Those two attribute noise were animated to bring more variations. Adding an animated rotation on the source was a very simple way to have the beginning of our vortex movement. This also allowed us to use this animation as a base to create a velocity attribute with the help of a trail node that computes the velocity. But as the rotation is linear, the velocity attribute was not so interesting at this point. This time, we relied on the attribute adjust nodes to first adjust the length of our velocity attribute, which corresponds to the speed, and then the direction of the vector. Once this was converted to a volume, it is possible to use a volume slice and volume trail to see easily the velocity attributes. The reason why doing so much work on the source is that once you have an interesting source, 70% of the effect is done we can finally get to simulation solver. The solver node will compute all the parameters and information that you set up before to make it become the simulation you want. The pyro solver is doing this in the case of fire or smoke simulation. Voxel and bounce options will help you get a good balance between quality and calculation time with the correct settings. The higher the voxel size will be, the less precise your simulation will look, but the faster it will be to simulate. The bound is the box in which the voxels are calculated, so you need to make sure that your bounds are fitting the simulation space as much as possible. The sourcing tab allows you to specify what attributes you want the solver to use in the simulation. So 
Here I could fetch my density, temperature and velocity attributes that we did work on earlier. Piles and shape tabs allow us to control parameters specific to the simulation itself. You can activate the ones you want to enable. Here, for example, I use dissipation to make my small disappear over time and played a lot with disturbers, turbulence and viscosity values until I had something that I liked. I also added a gas axis force node inside the power solver to have suction and orbit forces that will drag, rotate and repeal the smoke creating my vortex force look. The look tab will be used to tweak the smoke and fire aspect of your simulation. Here we didn't have fire, so the simulation was calculated considering that it is not fire that is simulated. And now we have the smoke portal simulation. After the solve node, caching the simulation thanks to a cache node becomes very important to retime it without having to calculate the simulation again. The file cache node becomes essential at this point. As our simulation will be an exported flipbook, we need to have a limited amount of frames and make sure the exported part of the simulation loops correctly. It is made very easily thanks to the make loop node. I was able to choose a part of the simulation I liked using the start and end thread inputs and the node automatically loops this part of the simulation. To make it easier later, I use the time blend node to make this part of the simulation start at the first frame. So now my looping simulation is 1 to 64 frames. Once the retiming is done, a new cache file node allows me to save my looping simulation before exporting it. As the six-way smoke feature uses textures that needs to be exported from DCC tools, we shipped exporter tools for Houdini and Blender to help you in the process of getting those textures. You can also use Embergen and their built-in exporter solution. Those exporters are available in the VFX toolbox project on GitHub. Thanks to the Houdini exporter that we provided, it was very easy to export the light maps with desired resolutions and light axes. The node also includes the render options for smoke, so it replaces the pyro back volume. Be careful, that means that your final results will have the look that you can preview on the exporter node, not the look pr from previous pyro back volume nodes. Once installed, the exporter node is located in the VFXG tab, where you can also access the light rig only if you want more control on export settings. We also have access to the flipbook option, so it's easy to export desired frames directly into a flipbook without requiring additional compositing. So at first, I exported 64 frames on the 8K texture with 8x8 flipbook layouts. I usually project my flipbooks on a simple quad particle, but in that case, it causes issue as it clips through the stairs or had to be pulled too much forward on it. Also, the default quad has low subdivisions, which is very convenient for optimization purpose, but was interacting wrongly with the use of APV for scene lighting. Using a parabola allowed me to have more volumes so it could be placed correctly with the stairs while getting the influence of side flame effects, in addition to avoid APV issue due to vertex evaluation of APV when small vertex density, for example on quads. It also blended better with distortion effect that is also using a parabola shape and the rest of the environment. We use the tool Tflow to generate motion vectors from the exported flipbook. The tool is available on the asset store. The motion vector map didn't need to have a very big resolution, so we exported it in a 256 texture. Here, you can see the comparison of with and without motion vectors. The difference is subtle, as we already exported a large amount of frame, but it is a nice quality improvement that doesn't cost too much. Using motion vector allowed to export less animation frames, you can increase the incrementation steps to jump frames and so export less or reduce texture size as the motion vector will compensate for quality loss. For very important effects, having a motion vector map can really make a difference in project quality. Thanks to the six-way smoke lighting feature, we can lit dynamically the smoke using real-time lights. The light positions were animated using the timeline to make it follow the portal movement. The orbiting lights that follow the vortex axis, in addition to the flickering ones from the fire, made a very convincing effect and showcased nicely the capabilities of smoke lighting. 
Here is a render of the smoke portal in Unity using only point lights with a script for the flickering and a timeline animation for the position. The main element for the flame effect is a flipbook exported from Houdini. The simulation was based on the Houdini built-in bonfire simulation and tweaked a bit to obtain the expected visuals. The flipbook were exported using the exporter available in VFX toolbox to get only the emissive map. We didn't need smoke lighting maps as the smoke is already made separately and flames are the source of the lighting, not the receivers. The exported emissive map format is 4x8 frames, size 1024 2048. Then we blended the flames with looping smoke puff from texture pack by Orson Farewell, available for Unity users, and we added a simple spark effect. Once the species were put together, we still need to add a vortex force that would attract all surrounding elements to the portal center, including this additional smoke we just talked about. The contour of the portal was a bit harsh and would betray the repeating of the animation. To improve a bit the blending of the portal with the background, we used the same spoke puff texture than for the flames. Using the small puff plussed all around the portal with various size, rotation speed and orbital speed added a lot of variation. The farthest the smoke is from the center, the less opaque it is. So it would really emphasize the fading of the portal influence with distance. To do this, we use the particle position at the effect is centered around the VFX pivot and use it in a lens node. That way we had the distance from particle to center. Using a remap and sun mass with a spawn radius and particle size, we remap the distance in a 0 to 1 range to use it in a simple curve node and then send it to color and alpha input. The animation curve allows us to remap the alpha as we wanted it to change depending on the distance range. The same method could be reused to make the internal smoke faster than the one in the edges. To have a coherent final result, we needed to have a global influence of the portal to the zone that surrounds it. If such a portal existed, we would expect all forces from it, resulting in fog and rock being influenced the same way a storm affects trees, papers and gravels. This is a very important way to connect all effects. In the portal effect itself, we added rocks and sparkers that would be dragged to the center of the portal, but also following the vortex force that happens around it. To do this, we combine rotation and attraction forces. For the rotation, we had to drag around the center of the effect, local position 0, 0, 0, which made it easier as we just had to use a cross product between particle position and center position without needed space conversions. Then, we added a bit of turbulence and the point attraction that is a subgraph made by Orson Favre. Point attraction can also be achieved using a conform to sphere node. Once the first prototype was made for the portal itself, we reused the same thing to create a VFX that would drag rocks and sparkers from the floor around the portal to its center. Once again, we placed the VFX at the center of the portal but used the box position to set the spawning area on the floor. We also used collision nodes to make the particles collide with the stairs so they don't go through it. To do that, we used SDF Breaker tool to bake the altar scene and use this SDF as collider. The most obvious missing interaction were the flames around the portal. It was weird that very close flames will not be influenced by the force that the portal is supposed to have. So we used again the vortex technique for the smoke part of the flame, which is a big advantage of having smoke as a flipbook composition instead of full simulation, as we can make various movements on the smoke and reuse it as much as we want. As a full simulation, we'd have been baked force influence looking simulation and would not be able to really interact with forces in visual effect graph. It is possible to use a VFX property binder to reference directly the game's object transform from the scene in the VFX inspector. This way, we were able to fetch the portal's center position. In addition of the smoke, we also needed the flames to be more oriented towards the center. Just adding a small angle to one of the flames worked fine, 
but the other one needed a very higher force, so we made a new simulation containing wind for this one. For those two flames, we exposed many parameters to be able to use the same effect and adapt it depending on the placement in the scene, as we are we're now using a wall position to dry the entire effect. After having all of this, we just added a discrete distortion effect to blend everything a bit better together. The portal now influences the surrounding area, which helps creating a credible environment using only visual effect graph. As you can see in the environment, we have a lot of crystals on the ground. They are made using VFX graph and using instancing feature. Using visual effect graph for those allowed to easily create a lot of variation using only two base meshes thanks to a lot of exposed properties. We use shadow graphs capabilities to create the material for the crystals, taking advantage of HGRP lead transparent material. The material properties were exposed and controlled in visual effect graph to create looks such as alpha depending on the particle size or adding randoms to those values. Then we placed the crystal on a cone shape and randomly inverted some of them to add variation in individual shapes as we used only two meshes and added variations in size, orientation, non-uniform scale and material options, just as said. Finally, we wanted to have complete control on the lights that would emanate and influence the crystals. As we currently don't have light support in visual effect graph, but we still wanted all the scene to be influenced by these lights, we used a sphere mesh and an emissive material in the crystal prefab with the VFX. Then, a simple script allowed us to control the emissive value for each game object separately, as changing directly the material applies to all objects using the material and not each individual. That way, we were able to adapt crystal intensity to their placement in the scene. This field light is considered in the render but the sphere itself is a non-rendered layer, so we don't see it in game view. When having such a complex VFX taking central place in the scene, we need to make sure to get the best quality possible while being mindful of performances. We talked a bit earlier about how motion vectors allow us to explore smaller flipbooks, but there are many other tips used. The new instancing feature allowed us to optimize the cost of crystals in the scene. As we have 52 of them, they can all be grouped in a single batch of size 52 instead of having 52 individual effects. The material is sent up a single time for all the instances of the same batch. This results in a performance game making us go from around maximum 35 milliseconds to 21 on a high-end computer with a 4K screen. The import settings of the texture played a lot. When changing max resolution, I was able to see what was the minimum texture size possible to keep a good quality for VFX or environment meshes. When finding a good balance between optimization and quality, I went back to Photoshop to manually reduce the texture size. That way, I was also being mindful of my project size. The portal flipbook was originally exported in 8K, but thanks to motion vector that compensated quality loss, I was able to downsize both light maps textures to 2048. As you can imagine, this is a huge reduction in file size. We went from two 30 megabytes textures to 16 and 12 megabyte textures. It is still a huge file size, but this is due to the place the portal will take in the scene and number of frames needed. Using alpha clipping helped reduce a lot the transparent overdraw, which is important because the fill rate means the amount of pixel a GPU is capable to fill in a frame buffer is a common bottleneck in real-time application. You can easily overwhelm the GPU drawing multiple times the same pixel. When doing the optimization pass, I had to modify a bit the first behavior, so the particles for smoke would fill the space in a way that allowed me to reduce their count. For the contour of this portal, we had at first a constant spawn rate and particles disappearing at the end of the lifetime, but it was easier to make a single burst and bound them 
where I want it, so I was sure to spawn the less possible amount of them and don't have to deal with fading out, making it possible to use alpha clip without too much visual impact on the effect. The goal was to have a very dark, mysterious environment that would highlight the portal as centerpiece, and we needed to be mindful of performances while trying to reach for a specific lighting setup with moving lights. The small point lights on the portal are using a small radius to avoid influencing the scene more than needed. A script is used to get the light flicker effect. This script is reused in many other lights. The moving lights are animated using a timeline. Those lights don't cast shadows as they don't influence the environment and it's not needed on the smoke. We use many spotlights around the flames to replace point lights and avoid light and shadows calculation where not needed. Spotlights are also used to do the fake fire lighting on the wall behind the portals. They don't use volumetrics and shadows. That way, the point lights for the flames could have a very smaller radius. A spotlight also allows us to light the path close to the portal for minimal performance cost instead of making all point lights a bigger range. This spotlight is directed towards the stairs and allows to have a contact shadows on the stairs and path, making it look like the portal's lights are influencing the environment and providing a lot of details compared to shadow maps. They are responsible for the volumetric effect that we see and shadow casting. Still completed with a small, small spotlight facing down and moved to light exactly what we wanted. They also have a flicker script that makes it look like it's the fire light. A few area lights are completing the ambient lighting on the path to the portal. And finally, the crystals are also contributing to the global illumination thanks to the emission sphere as we talked earlier. The fog environment is made using HDRP global settings. It allows to have a beautiful volumetric effect around the lights. It is completed with localized fog. Local fog volumes is a feature available on Unity 22.2 and higher, allowing to place boxes of fog in the environment in addition to global fog settings. We use that to create more fog effect on the ground while keeping clarity in the scene. But thanks to the blend mods, you can also remove fog, for example. Pop volumes is used to create baked indirect lighting without having to manually place probes in the scene. It is compatible with HDRP's volumetric fog, does not depend on the asset textures, and was perfect for the huge objects that we have in the scene, as it is using per pixel sampling instead of per object as we had in previous system. For VFX, prop volumes is based on vertex evaluation, so it is directly dependent on mesh vertex density. This does not cause these issues for static objects, but can be a problem for animated objects and create a flicker on the object's lighting. Increasing the vertex density of the object solves the issue as we saw with the portal lighting, where we had to use a parabola instead of a quad for mesh vertex density. The smoke lighting feature is already available for HDRP lead outputs on Unity 22.2 and will be available for shadow graph and URP outputs on Unity 23.2. We hope now that this sample will be helpful for you to discover more about Visual Effect Graph and its functionalities. You can explore Visual Effect Graph samples directly by clicking the button in the Packet Manager or using the link in the description. You can dive into various effects and learn from it to create amazing real-time VFX. We are available to answer your questions on Unity Forum in the Visual Effect Graph section. Thank you to the Graphics Tech Arts team and the Visual Effect Graph Developers team. Thank you for watching and see you soon.